Good evening. Good so evening. I, instead, Good I would have you. The Richards are not dancing tonight. <laughs> with us. So. so be on your best behavior. <laughs> yeah. Please. All right. Well, this is um, week nine, and um, two weeks from tonight is Monday Thursday. Um, so we won't be meeting that evening. Is there a service? Or? No, there's a service Good Friday night. So, I encourage you to participate in that. And, um, all right, so one of the lines in our um, study tonight is, for man does not know his time. You heard that before? Anybody? Yep. yep. OK. <laughs> Just checking. So what? You're in the last place. Thanks. <laughs> Beginning to wonder. <laughs> so um, you've probably heard this story, but uh, from the time that Abraham Lincoln was nominated as um, president, uh, or elected to be president, he started having dreams of his own death. Did you know that? No. And um, he um, shared um, those with some of his close friends friends, but um, uh, he had a particularly striking dream um, just shortly before he was actually assassinated, and one of his friends by the name of Ward Lamont was in the room when Lincoln was sharing this story, and I'd like to read just a little bit about um, of how that story got shared and, and uh, what happened. He writes, the most startling incident in the life of Mr. Lincoln was a dream he had only a few days before his assassination. To him, it was a thing of deadly import, and certainly no vision was ever fashioned more exactly like a dread reality. After worrying over it for some days, Mr. Lincoln seemed no longer able to keep the secret. I give it as nearly in his own words as I can, from notes which I made immediately after his recital. There were only two or three persons present. The president was in a melancholy, meditative mood and had been silent for some time. Mrs. Lincoln, who was present, rallied him on his solemn visage and want of spirit. Yeah, he used to that kind of old language. This seemed to arouse him, and without seeming to notice her sally, he said in slow and measured tones, it seems strange how much there is in the Bible about dreams. There are, I think, some 16 chapters. Okay, so we go. There we go. There are, I think, some 16 chapters in the Old Testament and four or five in the New Testament in which dreams are mentioned. And there are many other passages scattered throughout the book which refer to visions. In the old days, God and his angels came to men in their sleep and made themselves known in dreams. <coughs> Mrs. Lincoln here remarked, why, let's see, why, you look dreadfully solemn. Do you believe in dreams? I can't say that I do, returned Mr. Lincoln, but I had one the other night which has haunted me ever since. After it occurred, the first time I opened the Bible, and strange as it may appear, it was the 28th chapter of Genesis, which relates the wonderful dream Jacob had. I turned to other passages and seemed to encounter a dream or a vision wherever I looked. I kept on turning the leaves of the old book, and everywhere my eyes fell upon passages recording matters strangely in keeping with my own thoughts, supernatural visitations, dreams, visions, etc. He now looked so serious and disturbed that Mrs. Lincoln exclaimed, You frighten me. What's the matter? I am afraid, said Mr. Lincoln, observing the effect his words had upon his wife, that I have done wrong to mention the subject at all. But somehow, the thing has got possession of me. Like Banquo's ghost, it will not down. This only inflamed Mrs. Lincoln's curiosity the more. And while bravery disclaiming any belief in dream, bravely disclaiming any belief in dreams, she strongly urged him to tell the dream, which seemed to have had such a hold on him. But seconded in this by another listener, Mr. Lincoln hesitated, but at length commenced very deliberately. 
his brow overcast with a shade of melancholy. About 10 days ago, he said, I retired very late. I had been up waiting for important dispatches from the front. I could not have been long in bed when I fell into a slumber, for I was weary. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. It was light in all the rooms. Every object was familiar to me, but where were all the people who were grieving as if their hearts would break? I was puzzled and alarmed. What could be the meaning of all this? Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the East Room, which I entered. There I met with a sickening surprise. Before me was a catafalque, on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards. And there was a throng of people, some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House, I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which awoke me from my dream. I slept no more that night. And although it was only a dream, I have been strangely annoyed by it ever since. That is horrid said Mrs. Lincoln. I wish you had not told it. I am glad I don't believe in dreams, or I should be in terror from this time forth. Well, responded Mr. Lincoln thoughtfully, it's only a dream, Mary. Yeah, a few days later he was assassinated. So, man does not know his time, but sometimes God gives us some indication that... Um, our time may be near. So this is my question for you, just to talk briefly around your table. What do you think it means to die well? What do you think it means to die well? All right, take a couple of minutes and talk about that.
Some of you could share with us just some insights about um, what it would look like or what it means to die well. We all want to die well, I think. I think having few or no unreconciled relationships. Great, that came up in our group too. Yeah, good. To die knowing that I was going to be in the evening presence of Jesus. Okay. So having a sense of joy and anticipation that you're going to be in Jesus' presence, yeah. And that happy heart. I mean, it's it's a process, not being angry or discontent with the fact that you're going to die, but that your heart is happy. Okay, not being angry or anxious, but having a happy heart. I know from God's perspective, there's probably no such thing as an untimely death, but having observed and experienced some untimely deaths, it would be nice to have a timely one. In other words, some things taken care of in the time of life were, were so less painful. Okay. And to be observed, you know, young fathers or young mothers dying, and it often doesn't go well. Okay, 
so beyond just yourself, um, family, um, having the opportunity to be part of a, a more timely death rather than a sudden catastrophic sort of death. Talking with them, I think it was Woody Allen who said, I'm not afraid of dying, I just want to be there when it happens. Yeah. <laughs> or Billy Graham says, I'm not afraid of dying, I'm afraid of death in the process of dying. Yeah, the process of dying. Yeah, that's the challenge, isn't it? And to handle that well. Um, our son's father, Ray Kimball, handled it well. He had that um, lung cancer and um, slowly died, but he was just a man filled with peace and joy. And that was just evident to everybody, right? That's dying well. All right. Well, now that we're on to this, <laughs> yeah, I do appreciate the tombstone um, pictures you sent me. I, I um, was going to bring those tonight, but I didn't get that printed off. So. Yeah, she, um, Donna sent me 20 tombstones and the odd sorts of things that people say. In fact, I bet you could guess one. What is, what's on Mel Blanc's um, tombstone? Does Mel Blanc? Who's Mel Blanc? Or cartoons? Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. Yeah. Well, What's on his tombstone? Folks, remember that? That's all, folks. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty good. That was Albert Foot. What? Is that Albert Foot that said that? On Porky Pig. Porky Pig. Bling, bling, bling. That's all, folks. <laughs> Not as good as Mel Blanc, but. All right. Well, we should pray. <laughs> Father, in the garden, you told Adam that he was free to enjoy all that grew in the garden with the exception of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which you reserved for yourself. And he and um, his wife Eve partook and um, fell under the promised condemnation that they would die. And consequently, death has come into the world. And on one hand, that's a good thing because it um, ends uh, this um, life of sin. In fact, someone I think once said that to die is to stop sinning. <laughs> and uh, that's good news. And we are grateful that um, ultimately Christ has conquered death, has paid our debt, and um, we will someday uh, see the fullness of your kingdom on earth and we will see you. But Father, uh, we all, there's not one here who won't at some time and in some way or another um, come to the end of our life here. And um, so we do want to think about that and be aware of that and not marginalize death, but we want to live in light of it in a um, godly sort of way. So this evening as we look into this particular chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, would you Show us the things that we need to know and, and uh, in some way, Lord, we pray that you would apply your word to our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mary Ann, I think it was W.C. Fields 
that was lying on his deathbed, and somebody came in and found him reading the Bible. And they said, what are you doing reading the Bible? He said, looking for loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> looking for loopholes. <laughs> hmm. Well, you hope he found the grand loophole. Yes. Yeah. At the cross. It wasn't it um, Brezhnev's wife? Do you remember that story? Um, George Bush, George H. W. Bush, when he was vice president under Reagan, went to Leonid Brezhnev's funeral. And um, he said he saw one of the most profound things he'd ever seen. But um, Brezhnev's casket was up front. And um, they were concluding the service. And his wife went up there and counter to the culture and the government and everything, she made the sign of the cross on him. Yeah. Now, whether that had any effect or any significance beyond just the image of that, um, you know. God alone can tell, but she had some confidence in the cross. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But yeah. There are interesting things that happen when people die. All right. Um, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and let's look at verses um, 1 through 6 to begin with. Would someone volunteer to read that for us? Verses 1 through 6 of chapter 9. Thank you, Bob. All this I laid to heart, examining it, how the righteous and the wise and the deeds are in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, man does not know, both are before him. It is the same for all, but the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as the good one is, I think you like that line, verse 4, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. Did you like that line? Yeah, you did. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. So, um, verse 1. What is the preacher's point? What's he talking about here? This is a challenging verse. What do you think? I wonder why he said the righteous and the wise and the wicked were in God's hands. He didn't mention both. Not in the first verse. Yeah, he just mentions the righteous and the wise. Okay? We may get a glimpse as to why he might have done that. But what else is going on here? Don't count on the prosperity gospel. Don't count on the prosperity gospel. Okay? We have choices. We have choices. Okay. The actions of man's life are not controlled by man, but by God in some sense. And no one can know whether we're going to be afflicted with good or bad. Okay. 
Good. Yeah. Um, everything that we do is before us. Whether it's love or hate, we don't know. Um, you remember in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to love and a time to hate. Well, um, we don't know whether what happens tomorrow or next week or next year will lead to uh, broken relationships and hatred or mended relationships and love. Everything is before us. And we don't know what's before us. So yeah, you're exactly right. He's getting at the fact that you're not in control here. And the reason why I think he picks up the wise and the righteous, um, because they're not even in control. And it says in verse 2, it is the same for all. So he includes everybody at that point. The troubling thing about this is it seems to imply that either that we are uh, prone to make relationship mistakes uh, and or that betrayal is a uh, real possibility. Yeah. Yeah, we, we are either prone to uh, break relationships, fracture relationships, or on be the victims of that, be betrayed or be hurt. And that's just a reality, isn't it? I mean, all of us, I suspect, have in one way or another in, in, in the span of our lives experienced radical changes in relationships. We didn't foresee that coming. We didn't. Is there, is there a sense that the righteous and the wise, though, are in God's hands, meaning that we're protected or we're, I mean, there's something special there in relationship to God for the righteous and the wise. Mm -hmm. But it's not there for the wicked or the sinner. Isn't that true? I mean, that's, um, that probably theologically, biblically, that's true. Um, I don't sense that in this particular passage he's isolating them in terms of their, it, it's better for them because their lives are in God's hands because he goes on to say um, it's the same for all people in verse 2. It's the same for all. Okay, does that make sense? You and I don't know what tomorrow will hold what the circumstances or the circumstances or the conditions of our lives will be or relationships will be. Um, God does. By the way, one of the things that um, I think it was David um, Gibson in his book said that one of the objectives it seems to him of Ecclesiastes, and I think he's right, and that's to shatter the notion that you and I are God. Um, Okay, that's right. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. Is that tying in with the verse that talks about the rain falling on the righteous and the unrighteous? Is that the same conflict? Uh, um, sure. <laughs> I'd say it's a, it's a corollary to God's sovereignty and providence over the whole world. Yeah. You bet. It seems to be a theme of the whole book is that you are not special. <laughs> you're, not, you're not protected in any particular way. Ex yeah. See, yeah. I, I'm just in our reading program that my wife and I are in, we're in the Joshua, in the Joshua uh, where all these real clear cut promises are made. Follow these laws, you'll prosper. If you don't, you will be, you'll be destruction. You know, very, very formulaic. Uh, you know what else is pushing you to set us down and go to the end place? Yeah. Yeah, this whole notion of um, being like God 
that is inherent in all of us comes out of the garden, doesn't it? That was a temptation. That's what Eve and Adam bought into. That you will eat this fruit and God will, your eyes will be open. You'll become like God. And so that's been our struggle ever since. And this particular book is trying to say that's not the case. You're not. Now, you know, there may be um, in God's um, providence, I think we can say that there are promises he makes to his people that he doesn't make to the general population. And they are treated differently. But when it comes to the issue of control and to the issue of death, it's the same. All right, so question number two, what is the same event that happens to all? And in bringing that to our attention, what is the preacher's point? So verse two, it's the same for all. Since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice, as is the good, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. What is this event that comes to them all? Death. 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 Yeah, the mortality rate is 100% and you are one day closer to your own death than you were yesterday. Right? Okay. And it doesn't make any difference in... Uh, these categories. All right, now, um, look at verse 3. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Now, why is this an evil? Okay, so e so death is an enemy, and it's evil in and of itself. Given the immediate context, what's evil about death? Okay, pain, suffering, sure, sure. That's why Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb, I think. In the destruction of death. But in the preceding verse, what's the evil about, what's the evil that um, is um, characteristic of death here? That wasn't well, the question was it? This is an evil in all that is done. What is this? We know we talked about death is um, an evil under the sun, but particularly why is it evil in relationship to this context? Well, is, he, is he bemoaning the fact that it comes to both the righteous and the unrighteous? Yeah, what is that? What would we call that? Unfair. Exactly, that's it. It's unfair. It's unjust. Death is not fair. Death is not just. Now, the, theologically, there's a sense in which just death is just because God said it's just. But it, it treats wicked people and good people the same. That's not fair. This is an evil under the sun. Does that make sense? It implies, though, that there are good people. Yeah. I'm not convinced. <laughs> okay. Okay. All sinners. They're all sinners, and he has already made that case, and he'll make it again. I mean, what's the definition of good? Is it our definition, or is it God's definition? Is righteous good? It seems to be the case of some people being good, whether it's saved, like uh, the centurion. Cornelius. Cornelius was a righteous man. Joseph was a righteous man. Conversion occurred shortly after that. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to define your category. <laughs> Theologically, all are sinners. No one's good. And Jesus would say, why do you call me good? No one is good except God, right? And he looks at the disciples and says, though you are evil, all of you. But that's one category. The other category is that there are um, righteous and unrighteous people. There are good people and there are wicked people. Um, Psalm 1, the righteous will stand the, in the judgment. The wicked won't. They're like chaff blown away. I think it's hard to look at this without a New Testament lens. Yes, it is. That's, that's the... With the New Testament perspective, because our righteousness is in the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. But Lord willing, that righteousness is being worked out in the way you live. That's sanctification. All right. This is an evil. So, also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Preach on that sermon on Mother's Day, huh? <laughs> Say what? That's an attendance killer. <laughs> an attendance killer. <laughs> All right, so um, also, I, I would assume, connects it to this also is an evil. What's the connection between death coming to all and this the hearts of the children of man are full of evil what do you think what's the connection here original sin okay all right original sin everybody deserves eternal death okay everybody deserves eternal death Are you talking about the... Um, 3B. Okay. That's what I thought. Uh, this is not original thought. <laughs> Nothing in here is original. <laughs> uh, but in a, uh, a commentary that I was looking at today, indicated that uh, this is maybe saying that it was recognized by the good and the bad all were going to die. And if that's the case, why not just live it up and do whatever feels good and thus just go on sinning? And that's the madness of the whole thing. What, whose commentary are you reading? Uh, it was, uh, 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 this was uh, NIV study Bible, or, uh, not out of that Bible, but Oh, the NIV application? <coughs> well, application commentary? It's an application, it's a computer application oh. called Pragus. Okay. But the, but the commentary is a Zondervan. Oh, okay. That goes along with the NIV. Okay. Great. Perfect. Look at um, verse 11 in chapter 8. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of man is fully set to do evil. It's the same sort of thing. Um, because we don't see justice, we just let our sinful nature run wild. Um, and because we look and we see, well, you know, it doesn't make any difference if I go to church or don't go to church, we all die. So I'm just not going to go to church. Yeah. Why waste the time? Why waste the time? This is an evil under the sun. Madness. A madness, okay. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Um, okay, how about verses 4 and 5? Bob's favorite verses. <laughs> he read that with passion. <laughs> What's the point here? Yeah. Well, you know, 
talked before about what was really the, the Jews' thoughts on afterlife. These verses, to me, almost seem to indicate that they believed in annihilation. Because it almost is, once you're dead, I mean, you're done. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it definitely doesn't give any indication that there's an afterlife there in these verses. No reward. And yet, it indicates there's hope. And where does it indicate Where? that? Verse 4. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> only while you're alive. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. there's still an opportunity. Now, once you've died, it's over. Yeah. But there's okay. still an opportunity while you're living. Okay. Um, did that come from that Zondervan candle? No. Okay. <laughs> That's Butchism. Butchism. <laughs> That's original. Uh, the hope here probably isn't in an afterlife. The hope is as long as you're alive, you can do something with your life. Yeah. yeah. But when you're dead, you're dead. Did the, did the idea that we already talked about this a long time ago, but did the, the fact that Ecclesiastes does not seem to support an afterlife, is that ever a consideration as to whether as long as you can? Um... It, um, I don't recall, but it may have. The, the interesting thing about the Jewish understanding of um, the afterlife is like many things in Scripture, it's, it, it's progressively revealed. And so even David would say, do people praise you in Sheol? Right, but he knew he'd see his uh, dead kids. He did. Yeah, but there's this sense that the place of the dead, and it really, you know, it depends on your reference point and how you're talking about it. Um, but in much of the Psalms, you'll find that um, there's not a whole lot of activity in Sheol. Um, uh, except, I mean, there, like I said, there's, there, there are these glimmers that there's going to be something greater. Well, they, that's they, not even de developed until later. In, they, they believe that uh, you can see the dead and were permitted to sit and do it. Um, yeah. Yep. Saul yeah. is guilty of that. Yeah. But, um, again, uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes is just trying to describe life as it is on earth under the sun and what we can observe. And all we know is once we put you in the ground and throw dirt on you, that's it. You're dead, dead, dead. That's all we see, that's all we know. Now, he's going to, I mean, he even mentions here later on, um, Let's see. Oh no, sorry. I had it myself. In chapter 11, he talks about the fact that we will all um, face judgment after we die. So he does, have, he does have that perspective on one hand, but what he's trying to do is just describe life as we see it here. What about um, 5b? Oh, yeah. Uh, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. Go on. Even the memory of them is forgotten. This says, for the memory of them is forgotten. So the sense is that there's nothing more they can do on earth. They're gone. They can't even do anything to promote their memory. There's no more reward for their toil. But if you were living, what would the further reward be? Just the fact that you have some more time and can think and mm -hmm. tell what's important. Yeah, and, and, and work and enjoy your wife and enjoy your kids and grandkids, great-grandkids. 
Right. 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 A living dog is better than a dead lion. So a, a dog, yeah, they were um, despised, contemptible sort of creatures. Um, and a lion was the, um, someone said, the hero of beasts or the king of beasts, right? And so his, his point is, um, yeah, it's much better to be a, a, a poor despised beggar who's living than a dead king. Because at least while you live, you have stuff you can do. Now, that ought to, um, there's a contradiction here, not a contradiction, a paradox here with things he said before about living and dying. Anybody remember? Some of the more grim statements in this book. <laughs> hey, you know, we could title this The Grim Reaper. What's your question? Well, there's a contradiction here. It, well, a paradox here. He said it's better... Um, he who is joined with all the living has hope for a living dog is better than a dead lion. But in other places in this book, he said it's better to be dead than to live. Or to even be born. Or, yeah, yeah. Better is the stillborn, I think, was one of his lines. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Says, the, day of death is better than the, day. the day of death is better than the day of birth. Yeah. yeah. So there's a paradox there. He, he, um, and it really depends on uh, your perspective and what he's... Um, getting at. When he talks about it's better to be dead, he's, he's focusing on just the tragedy of living in a cursed world and having to go through that. But once you're here, <laughs> um, at least you've got an opportunity to enjoy the good gifts of God and do good, and um, you've got an opportunity to do something, whereas if you're dead, you're dead. So it's a matter of perspective. It's not necessarily a contradiction. Verse 6, their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. This, we're talking about life on earth. Once they bury you, you're done here. The world continues to turn, but you don't share in that at all anymore. You're gone. All right. But don't think that, I mean, for a time, at least, people will still be learning from us and remembering, you know, that maybe we were a blessing to them or that we helped them or that we treated them kindly or taught them something. That's not going to be gone immediately. I mean, surely not. Right? I mean, uh, I think that's true. The memory of the righteous is a blessing. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of eternity, what does it say? A day is unto a, as unto a thousand years. So we may think, yeah, somebody's going to think good of me. For 20, 50, 100 years, maybe. Remember something good. But that's just a flash in time compared to eternity. Yeah. And eventually, nobody's going to know anything. <laughs> yeah. How many of you um, remember and think about or know anything about your great grandparents? Okay. Three of you, four of you? Okay. I knew one great grandparent. Um, you knew them personally, or you knew about them? Knew him personally. I know absolutely nothing about the others. Never met my my mom's folks. They died when she was in high school. So um, her whole half of the family, I know virtually nothing about. 
so, but even so, there are maybe four or five of us out of this group that knew much of anything about our great grandparents. And great great grandparents, you only know anything about him if, as if he's a genealogist. Yes, families who do family histories. Um, yeah, but for the most part, people die and they're forgotten. Um, David said, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. No. Now, that is supposed to do something to you. What's it supposed to do? Yay. <laughs> I like the end of six. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. I am done with this life, this earth. I'm in, I'm in, I look forward to that. Okay. So I'm reading it while I work away at school. Reading it as a Christian. Reading it as a Christian. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so there is an anticipation that all of our sorrow, all of our struggles, all of our, um, all the resident sin in us uh, will be no more. Okay? And I will have no part of it that happens here on earth. I won't be in the presence of sin. Okay. Okay, yeah, you're taking out of this realm and brought into a whole new realm where there is no sin. Yeah, never again will they have a part yep. in anything that happens under the sun. Okay. Well, there are those who know. That's a great Christian twist. It's not his intent. <laughs> I know. But the point is, what this is supposed to do is to press you to think about, what am I living for? Am I living for things here? Because if I am, someday, and I don't know when that day is going to be, it's all gone. And nobody's going to care. So, if that's the case, maybe I need to live for something else. Right, let's press on. Um, would someone read verses 7 through 10? This oh. is the happy section. Go Do for it, Nita. I think you've caught the flavor and the passion of the passage. It's great. It's really I almost did. Okay, what, what's his advice here? We've heard some of this before. Anything new? He brings up marriage. He brings up marriage this time. Do it with all your heart. Okay, or all your might is what ESV yeah, says. Yeah. Okay. Maybe or... Okay. Yeah. So whatever work you've got to do, do it to, to the best of your ability with all that you've got. Because there's coming a day when you can't work. Yeah. So this isn't just a party lifestyle. It also includes work and toil, but do it with all your might. We're not designed to be lazy or slothful. Okay, what else? Okay, all right, so the specter of death 
ought not, um, or ought to be a motivator, and um, death shouldn't be just a um, reason for apathy or laziness or withdrawal. Okay? Yeah, that's the big reason at the end, isn't it? For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. You're headed there, and you're closer to that place today than you were yesterday. And so keep that in mind. Make the most of your time. Yeah? What does it mean that um, in verse 7, for it is now that God favors what you do? The last part of that. What does, what does that mean? God has already approved what you do is Verse 7, go, eat your bread, and joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. And you said, yours says God now has approved what you do? For it is now that God has favored what you do. For it is now that God has favored what you do. Well, um, how can we marry those two different translations? What's the point here? I think it's that while you're living, God gives you an opportunity for joy and some happiness. Yeah. And because he's given you these things, he's approved of it. I mean, he doesn't give us good things and say, don't touch. <laughs> and in fact, I was thinking about this today. Can you imagine your father giving you a good gift and you... Um, being afraid to take it, unwilling to take it, um, you know, with some sort of false humility or something. I mean, your father, if you're in your fathers, or mothers, you know that when you give gifts to your children, you want them to enjoy them. And that brings you pleasure. But if your children don't enjoy them, it doesn't bring you any joy, right? He's approved of this. He likes you to eat bread and drink wine. With gladness and joyful heart. With gladness and a joyful heart. Okay. This married couple back here. <laughs> they don't get in spats. They just it laugh just at each other. It reminds us of examples in life that, are, that we're witnessing. Okay. <laughs> You know, it takes a word or two to bring it up to each other. <laughs> okay. All right. uh, First Corinthians 4, where Paul's talking about judging nothing before he so he doesn't judge himself and judge nothing before his time. Uh, Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes, and he'll bring the light who is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of the heart. And at that time, each will receive their praise from God. Another, make the connection for me, Dwayne. Well, it's, it's First Corinthians four. That uh, um, God has already uh, already approved what you do. Okay. All right. Yeah, that passage in First Corinthians four, Paul says um, he doesn't even judge himself. He waits for the time when God will bring to light all things. That's a future judgment. Um, this is a little bit different in the sense that because God has given you these things, he's approved of it. He's judged it okay. So go ahead and enjoy it. Is there any sort of Calvinistic perspective within this verse? Um, help me. In, in the sense that if God's already approved something, it's going to happen if he's, he's allowing it and or sovereignly he's making it happen. So I'm just wondering. I, I don't know that I subscribe to that. Um, I certainly think that's the backdrop to this. Um, in this particular verse, I think it's more the sense of 
these are his gifts to you. Go ahead and enjoy them. He's approved it. I'm glad you're using that. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather have you do that. Um, yeah, but having said that, I do think there's a, um, a backdrop to God's sovereignty over all things and his providence over all things. Yeah, he's the good governor. In contrast to that, looking at verse, the last part of verse 10, where it says, For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. Yep. Can you imagine what that's just, what would there be without any work or any thought or any knowledge? Yeah. Um, yeah, let me just say this to that. Um, it does sound horrible, but I think what, I think what um, the preacher here envisions is um, once you put in the coffin and put it in the ground, there's nothing happening there. Now, we would know theologically and biblically the bigger picture that um, once a person dies, their soul either goes into paradise or into um, uh, Sheol or Hades or wherever the place of the dead where God is not. So, um, and then ultimately at the resurrection, um, I think even people in hell, there's knowledge, I think there's work, and I think there's, what else did he eliminate? Wisdom. Well, probably not wisdom. <laughs> There's thought, um, but it's all it's it's um, it, it's it's all of that stuff without any element of good in it. It would be just horrible, horrible regret. That's the only thing that I can. Yeah. That would be your only thought. Yeah. Terrible regret. Regret. That's the gnashing of teeth and weeping. Yeah where the worm never dies, there's that torment, ongoing torment, but utter darkness. Regret? I'm sorry? Is there regret? They don't, they're still shaking their fist at God, so there's no regret, wishing they would have done it differently. They're, they're glad to be where they are. Well, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth doesn't sound like gladness to me. Well, but it's... There's torment. Yes, but... Well, yeah, I mean, the, the um, rich man Lazarus seems to indicate um, some, yeah, good. Well, I don't know if regret's the right word, but that's not happening. Yeah. Can I give you another little twist on verse 10 <laughs> that says, uh, working with all your might? Yes, sir. For in the grave, where you're going, there's not going to be any chance to work or do anything. And Zondervan again made a reference, and he said uh, to 2 Corinthians 5, 10, which says, For we must all appear before judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Sounds kind of like a rewards sort of a thing, which kind of makes you think this teacher is maybe saying, do good while you can do it, because it may help. <laughs> <laughs> Because when you're in the grave, there's no more chance. Yeah. Um, whether he had that in mind or not, um, I, I, I can't say, except that I do think he's focusing just on life here. He's not yet to that point, or at least not bringing it up here, that what you do here will be rewarded there. He will later. So, um, Let me just read this verse real quick. Um, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So, 
um, there is uh, not necessarily any inherent virtue in asceticism, but there, that's um, 1 Timothy 6, about 17 or so. Um, all right. Um, garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. What's that mean? Anybody? The Bible has a dash of cologne. A dash of cologne. <laughs> what Bible is that? <laughs> NLT. That's the New Living Translation. A dash of cologne. Oh. Boy, is that chauvinistic or what? Something I read said it speaks of joy. Okay. And happiness. Yeah. Yeah, you're wearing white garments as opposed to black. You've got oil on your head. Oil is always um, uh, connected to gladness. And a blessing. blessing. I'm sorry? And a blessing. And a blessing. Yeah. Well, the garments of white, when I read it, I thought perhaps it was talking about um, a purity. White garments. Yeah. I, white garments in terms of purity, it's... Yeah. Um, uh, there's certainly some symbolism to that in, in the scriptures. I don't think that's here, because he's just talking about just go eat and drink and wear white clothes and put oil on your head. I think it's just very earthy. Frequent laundry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that's somewhere. <laughs> kind of next to enjoying your husband. <laughs> Well, I, 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 well, I think there's a, uh, in hell, this is my opinion, that there's a genuine, genuine disposition of rejection of God and everything he stands for. Is there regret over the things that they've done in their life? Perhaps. I mean, I think weeping and gnashing of teeth indicates some sort of recollection of... That makes them miserable. That makes them miserable. You know, if you read, and this is extra biblical. What's his name? Peretti? Frank Peretti's books? Um, he has some interesting images of heaven and hell in some of his novels. And one that I particularly remember is um, Safely Home in that novel. He, uh, that's Randy Alcorn. Oh, Randy Alcorn. That's right. I'm sorry. Not Frank Peretti. Erase that. Randy Alcorn. Thank you. Safely Home. He has this... Um, draws this picture, or paints this picture, of Mao Tse Tung in hell. And um, all that he hears, the only thing he hears, is the screams and cries of people. The people he caused to suffer all of his life. And I think that's where that weeping and gnashing and torment comes. You can't get rid of that. He takes that with him. That doesn't mean his heart is regretful. Oh, no. No, in fact, Alcorn paints that picture that the people who go there, um, they hate God. Nobody goes to hell but those who want to be there. Unless you read Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Where you can... That's fair. That's right. Depart Lord, Lord. I knew you not. Yeah. Right. Depart from me, you evildoers. Or for that matter, the ten virgins, right? Yeah. Well, I've been come knocking at the door, let us in or not. Sorry. And to add to the perspective, I think you know every Good. knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There yeah. will be a moment of clarity when every created human being will go, oh crap. <laughs> Jesus was the real deal. He's absolutely gorgeous. I want him. What did I do? Yeah, maybe whether or not they say what if I want him, yeah. that's up for well, it may be. Yeah, I mean, I want him. 
or they'll recognize who, yes, he is God, but I still don't want anything to do with him. Yeah, um, yeah. What about the people who say, I could just imagine people saying, why didn't I listen? I heard about that other place, and now I'm here, and why didn't I listen? That's scripture according to me. <laughs> you know, I'm going to back off on that for a minute. Um, we'll have to talk about this more fully at, at some point. But um, my, I think in the grand scheme of things, um, in God's, according to God's sovereign grace, I don't think anybody longs for him, wants him, seeks him, apart from his redeeming work in their soul. And so I think Matthew 7, the passages in Hebrews 6 and chapter 10, those warning passages are to warn us. They're not making a, necessarily a theological statement as much as don't think just because you've done these things that you're going to get into heaven because of them. So they're warning passages. So Romans uh, three eleven says there's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. That's right. Yep, and the only ones who do are those that he's made alive. Okay, now where'd we leave off? Verses eleven through seventeen with or eighteen. Would someone read the rest of the chapter here for us? else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. A fish, as fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man, so I said, wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Okay, there are kind of two parts to this, 11 through 12 and, and then 13 through 18. So let's, um, what's the point here of verses 11 and 12? These are some lines you've probably heard before. They've become part of our cultural language. Why is the race not to the swift? Or the battle not to the warrior? The skillful just won't go into that. In terms of man, it's different. Okay. Because God is in control. Okay, so, all right. Because God's in control, man doesn't always. The best people don't. Okay, win. the best people don't always win. Okay. Yeah, even though we would think that winning is all that matters in our time. Can you, if you think of any examples of this sort of thing? I think it's saying that, before an example, the 
think it's saying that status does not ensure favor or blessing. Status doesn't ensure favor or blessing, okay. And mm -hmm. in the way of an example, um, just look at some sports figures or some very prominent people who die young make a mess of their lives even though they've got status and money and everything. Okay. All right, so people who do have gifts and abilities, their lives are cut short. Yeah, the end of 11. Um, time and chance happen to them all. What's he mean by that? Anybody have anything different than that? Is it fate? Fate, did you say? Yeah, because it refers back to chapter 2, verse 14, which I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. So. Okay, God ordained circumstances is probably fair. It, it can mean um, um, yeah, uh, hard conditions or, or circumstances that fall upon people. Um, so the runner is running a race and um, he's the swiftest but he gets tripped. Um, the um, intelligent person um, uh, gets in a car accident and um, doesn't get the riches that may we expect or we might expect for that person. Um, yeah, things are not under our control. And um, this is where um, we live in a cause and effect um, world in many respects, in a cause and effect culture. We turn on the light, we turn on the switch, and the lights go on. And we do this in every area of our lives. And so you begin to think that we are in control of things, that we can make things happen. And so we get our education, we get our degrees, um, we train, we do all those sorts of things and we expect a certain effect from all that we've done. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes here is saying, well, that's not always the case. Um, because um, time and circumstances fall on everybody. And you're not in control. Yes. Um, you know, in our family, our son, who was a pastor, was planting a church and it was thriving and everything was great. And he gets cancer and he dies on his 33rd birthday. And we think, oh, this is terrible. This is what people were sick. Why would God take, I mean, we all know this, right? God takes people before we think he should. Okay. Because that, obviously, that was God ordained. God allowed that cancer and, mm -hmm. and allowed it to take him. Yeah. Let me give a thumbnail sketch so the people on the watching could get a piece of that story. It's Dan, your son Dan. 
um, planted a church? Elk River, Minnesota, and the church flourished, grew, and then cancer um, took Dan's life. Um, but that led to this um, um, the expansion of his ministry through a book that he had written. During his suffering. During his suffering. Yeah, that, what was it called? The point a place of, called Surrender. A Place Called Surrender. He kept saying that in spite of everything, he would rather be where he was at that particular time because he learned what it meant to serve. Okay, that's dying well. And I need to read it to learn. Yeah. Okay. What, what year did he die? Uh, on his 33rd birthday. Left to go for his wife. But from our perspective, we would view that as a tragedy um, because it, there was so much potential, and we anticipate that. But we're not in control. God's designs and plans are different than ours. All right. Yes. First, the word I do not like is chance. That really rubs me wrong. I mean, because I don't care if things are different than how I plan them, if I think that God's in control. But chance is almost like things just happen, you know, like car wrecks or something. But I, that really bothers me to think, I guess, there's really such a thing as chance, because I just want to think that God is in control of all of it. Right, and I, I agree with that. And particularly as Presbyterians, we don't believe in luck or chance. Right? <laughs> However, if you're, just, if you're just a person looking at the world, these things don't make sense. And so, from a purely objective perspective of life under the sun on earth, time was cut short. And it was chance that he got cancer and not someone else. I mean, these things are random, nonsensical, to, and chaotic, just people living on the face of the earth. You and I have a different perspective. We see God's hand behind all things. But he's not writing from that perspective. That's the tension we're always wrestling with. That's a worldly perspective on all of this. Yeah. Is it's the luck of the draw? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to Donna and the rest of us, it's not. Yeah. There's well, more to it. Sometimes it's written on as coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. When there's not an awareness that God is in control, then sometimes things are written on as coincidence. Yeah. In, uh, in our reading, uh, we're uh, in the end of uh, Judges, where the land is being divided up and I think it was in the, I think we're reading in the NLT and it's, it's it's divided by divine lot is the term that's used in the first time that that was used uh what think what call it this eyeball uh, so what appears to be chance I to some sort of kind of a lot I guess it was called a divine lot. Yeah a roll of the dice. Yeah. Yeah God used that. The lot is cast into the lap, lap, but the decision is from the Lord, right? Um, but, but let's be um, honest about this, too. I think even for us, um, I, I think of um, friends who have died, and I um, certainly there was um, God displayed in some measure his glory through their death, but you, you wonder, why did God take him? I don't have an answer for that. Um, he left three kids, you know, young children. And, and there is that sort of mystery to it as well. And I think that's all he's saying is that we can't explain that. We don't know why. We don't know exactly why no, God took Dan. In his hospitalization and relationships with, uh, he preached in the chapel uh, in Tijuana, and you know he was a blessing. But other people blessed him and his parents yeah. and us. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. And that's all part of God's plan. All of the whole details of people who came into the hospital room. The fact that I got to hold him as he died. All of that was just God's plan. It was, Tammy wasn't even there. His wife was not there. It was all a matter of hours and minutes and experiences. Everything fell into God's plan. Mm -hmm. The That's a great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We need to wrap it up here. This last section. Oh, um, and basically, verse twelve. Just we don't know the time of our death. That's pretty simple. It comes upon us. Well, as Reverend Ford said in Pollyanna, death comes unexpectedly. Remember that? We do. And thunders, remember the chandelier shakes? 13 through um, 18, what's the point here? Anybody? Society honors wealth, attractiveness, and success above wisdom. Perfect. Perfect. Say it again. Society honors wealth, attractiveness, and success above wisdom. Yep. Society values um, wealth, success, attractiveness, beauty, strength, all those sorts of things um, more than wisdom. And, and, and you can tell the stepbrothers they attribute wisdom to those people when there is <laughs> Isn't that the truth? If you've got money, suddenly you're an expert on something, right? <laughs> yeah, you get a platform, and the poor person who has wisdom is forgotten, but it's the wisdom that really affects positive change. It's the wisdom of a poor man who saved the city. And it's the quiet words of a wise person that's um, better than the shouting of a foolish ruler or a ruler among fools. So, okay. Dan, could you, uh, in verse 16, mine says, but the poor man's wisdom is despised. Uh, do you have another word for that? Despised? No, that's all I have as well. But I'm just saying, when I think of despised, I think of disliked, hated. Uh, is that really what this is saying? Or is it just forgotten and ignored? What's the difference? Didn't learn anything from it. What's the difference? I think this is saying that they, they didn't learn anything. I don't know, despised just didn't quite seem like the right word for it. Yeah, despised, rejected, forgotten, okay, discounted. Okay. Rejected, forgotten, that's, to me, that means more sense. Well, it's like um, Vicki said, um, and you see, I, frankly, I think you see it in our culture. Um, sure. You have people who have money and who have power and who have positions who are fools, who get more credibility than um, the quieter voice of reason and wisdom. Yeah. All right. Um, any lessons? Anything that you want to share with us? You'd like to take? <clears throat> you want to take away from this chapter? Terrific. Thanks, Vicki. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's wrong to long for death? And what do you think? Philippians 1. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Yeah. I want to be careful here. Um, I, I, I think I think there can be a healthy longing to be with Christ. I think there can be an unhealthy longing just to escape. And I think there can be an unhealthy longing. Um, I mean, I I read this account of this Christian woman who committed suicide. And it was really messed up. Um, it was terribly selfish and self-centered. She just, she kept rationalizing she just wanted to be with Jesus, but she was ignoring everything around her. And I don't think that's healthy at all. So, and I, you know, I think Paul, he longed to be with Jesus, but he understood that he had still had something to do here. And the issue for him is whether he lives or dies, it's Christ. That was going to be it. So I think that's our situation. Whether we um, live or die, we want to um, do it all in relationship with and for his glory. Right? Does that help? Let me close with um, a couple of thoughts. Um, death is the ultimate, this is um, Ian Provan. Death is the ultimate proof, if we need one, that our pretensions to be gods are utterly foolish. But death is also the phenomenon that makes it too late to address our error. And so one of the things we need to do is we need to recognize that death really does come to all of us and we need to recognize that before it comes to us. Um, I read the story of a gentleman who was in the hospital with his daughter who was dying. And uh, this is in London. And a specialist came in and uh, said he wanted to put them in contact with this other specialist who might be able to bring some help his daughter and the father said well I really appreciate that um, a lot um, but let's also remember that we this is where we all come to we all come to this point of, of death and realizing that um, I think helps it helps think about how we live but also I think helps us to die well All right, unless anybody else has something to share, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that um, we don't live simply under the sun, but we have been redeemed, we have been set free from the dominion of the devil and we have been brought into the kingdom of your son and so that's where our home is that's where our citizenship is 
And so we are glad that you have caused us to be born again into a living hope. And uh, so, Lord, we're grateful for that. But I, I do pray that as we um, think about this book of Ecclesiastes and see the world as it really is under your curse, that that would help us to not live for things here, but live for your kingdom. So thank you for our fellowship. Thanks for this time in your word. And uh, thank you for your wonderful faithfulness to us and your provision for us in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good application, Dwayne. Thank <laughs> you.